Alafia. I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore Peace, also known as Afia Ampansa. I'll tell you more about that later. But I first want to give credit to the sponsors of today's show because of the generous donation of friends of mine, Thelma and Toussaint Perkins, we are able to have this broadcast. Even though this is a non-for-profit uh, television station, there still are some costs in producing these shows, and the generosity of friends like Thelma and Toussaint Perkins enable us to continue after more than a dozen years of telecasting to continue to bring you what we hope is quality programming. Today's program is called Education and Ethnicity, and when I saw the title come up, I realized that it should have gone, been the other way around. It should have been Ethnicity and Education because ethnicity comes first, education follows, but forgive us for, forgive me for the oversight. I'd like to introduce my guest one of whom is a surprise to me, but a delightful surprise. I'm always glad to have him in the studio with me, and that's Hunter Haviland Adams III. Hi, how are you? I'm glad good. Glad to be here again. I'm glad to have you here again. And then, of course, I have Aris White, whose name I'm just learning to pronounce because I've been, I've been pronouncing it according to another person whose name is spelled the same way with a different pronunciation. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. Okay. Well, let's, we want to talk about ethnicity and education because we want to look at the, the, the premise that education should be centered in the people for whom the education is intended. You just can't have some uh, clinical education that you just some canned version of, of instruction that you impose upon everybody and think that it will have the same effect or even a good effect on everybody. And I know you've been working with this, and so I wanted you to tell me something about the work that you've been doing and the people who are involved in it, uh, Iris. Okay, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, we do, unfortunately, in the United States have a canned version of education. And that's why when you look at the numbers of the children of color, um, that those communities are not being are not being serviced. There, um, we have a high dropout rate when it comes to our youth in high school, and when they get to college, that rate even falls even more. You know, um, also when it comes to our children feeling comfortable about themselves. When I say our children, I'm talking about children that are of African backgrounds, African heritage. In the Western Hemisphere, you have North America, South America, and the Caribbean. So I don't exclude any of the African presence in those, diff those different regions because we are in the diaspora. So the Northern African American, and then you have the Afro-Latinas and Latinos, and then you have the Africans in the Caribbean. And unfortunately, we have not uh, created a, what I call a universal program in which we have a framework in which it doesn't infringe on the nuances and the, uh, the cultural nuances in those regions, but it has a framework that connects with the experience, the African experience in North America, South America, and the Caribbean. Because when you think about the transatlantic slave trade, that's what occurred. Those are the diff different regions that we end up landing. The first, which was heavily populated, was uh, Brazil. You know, I'm um, not saying the first, but that's the area where the most Africans were taken to was Brazil. And then the next number was North America. And then the next number comes into play in Colombia, South America. But those numbers, um, if you take the total numbers of Africans in the Western Hemisphere, are greater in South America than it is in the Caribbean and North America. What we have done at Rooted Africans, have created relationships with the Afro-Latinas and Afro-Latinos. And people say, well, why uh, are they calling themselves Afro? When they acknowledge Afro, they're acknowledging the African presence in themselves, that they are no longer going to be defined by the region that in which they live in, but they are going to take ownership of being the African in the diaspora. You know, Malcolm said that you, if a cat gives birth to kittens in an oven, you don't call them biscuits. And so that's what we need to recognize is what you say we need here 
in this country to understand that we are American-born Africans. We're not right. bis biscuits. Right. And consequently, with a heritage and a culture still intact that we need to tap into and to stay connected to so that we can maintain balance and sanity. So you are working with um, people in these various regions, and mm -hmm. most, most recently you've been doing what? I've been working with the um, Afro-Colombian community with education. Okay. Uh, they have, even under siege, most people when you think of Colombia, they think of uh, drugs. Mm -hmm. And um, they're not thinking that the Afro-Colombian community has been under siege because of, of the drugs. Mm -hmm. Not so much as drug trafficking as it is Plan Colombia, a plan that has been developed in the United States for over the past six years that support the drug trafficking. Because six years ago, 25% of the drugs that were sold in the United States came from Colombia. Now, 90% of the drugs that are uh, sold in the United States come from Colombia. So, and we've been putting more money towards stopping this so-called trafficking situation. But those funds have found themselves with paramilitary, found themselves with the government, and so forth. And what has happened is that the Afro-Colombians have been moved off their ancestral lands and been displaced. We think of, when we uh, think of uh, uh, a war state and Africans being moved off their land, we think of Sudan and Darfur. And we can even think of the Congo. But Darfur is the number one of what we call IDPs, internally displaced populations. But Colombia is number two, which is closer to us and that we are more interact, we interacting with that country more so than we are in Darfur. But under siege, this community of Africans have created a teacher certification program in which they certify people to teach children that are Africans in the diaspora. So they are light years ahead of us because we don't have a certification program. We have created an African-centered curriculum in North America, and we have implemented that curriculum but we have not implemented a certification program or got the state to acknowledge such a program. So it just lets you know the creativity and the intensity of a movement that exists there. And that movement is called, um, it's the Afro-Columbian Civil Rights Movement. And as they moving forward, they are gathering um, a round table of Africans in the Western Hemisphere and Panama and Haiti, Dominican Republic, and of course in Colombia, and in Venezuela, and um, coming together to create that network that's needed to support each other in a movement for human rights, as well as in a movement to educate our children for the legacy in the, in our, for our future. Before I go to Hunter, I have to just stop by this, 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 and just, you know, just praise the the invincibility of African people, That's right. the in ingenuity of African people, you know, even under siege, mm -hmm. not to have caved in mm -hmm. to the circumstances, to the oppression and to the abuse and the violence against them, to think of being displaced in your homeland, to think of being uh, um, uh, uprooted right and when you say rooted africans yes you know to to have been w over here we talk about homelessness mm -hmm. which means that people don't have a place to live in the communities where the rest of the people whom they know are who are their family members and friends are living mm -hmm. that's a different situation entirely yes, from being is. removed entirely from your community and 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 uh, and and put into a a permanent condition of 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 um, I don't know what to call it, you know. To to say refugee is is not quite enough no, no. because refugee sounds like it's a it's a at least a transient state, you know, right. that you're a refugee until you get somewhere and then you're no longer a refugee. But you're a refugee without a future of being anything elder other than that. 
And so to think of the resilience of our people, that we would be able to be creative in mm -hmm. that environment, which is, again, the proof that we need to understand that we are not the product of our circumstances. Right. Right. We, are, we do not engage in criminal activity because we are in impoverished conditions. We are not, we don't, you don't X and we Y. Mm -hmm. You don't A and we B. We are the, 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 the unknown people who are not predictable in the sense that you cannot say, like putting rabbits in a Skinner box, I mean rabbits, rats in a Skinner box, mm -hmm. that the only responses that we know is either go toward punishment or go toward reward, we will go through the top of the box. Right. <laughs> you know, we will create another angle to deal with our situation. And so I just had to stop by just to observe that, you know, we too can do this. Mm -hmm. Here in America, even as beleaguered as we are in our communities, we can create, we can. we can come up with new ideas, we can continue to go forward. And, and for you to sit here and tell us, give us that example, is just, I just, I'm so inspired by that. And then when you speak of the African Senate curriculum, I know that Hunter Adams has had just, he was on the ground floor right. Right. of that movement. And right. in fact, uh, his status today may in fact have something to do with his very deep involvement with that work. Talk to us about that African-centered curriculum that was finally uh, developed and put into place. Well, it, it began with, um, well, at least this phase of it began, a phase began with the African community in Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. who sued the school system there to desegregate the curriculum, okay, because they were concerned about where do we find ourselves in the curriculum, mm -hmm. African people in the curriculum. And of course, at that time in the 80s and before, you know, we were always on the periphery. We were subjects, not the object of history, those who were creating mm -hmm. uh, things. And so they won their lawsuit, and so the school board. Um, managed to contact one of my friends and elders, the late Dr. Asa Hilliard, who came on as a consultant with the idea to develop a series of essays which would be used as resource documents, not as a curriculum, mm -hmm. but just initially as a resource to augment the curriculum mm -hmm. in elementary school. Mm -hmm. And so at the beginning, part of the process was the Portland, Oregon School Board convened a hearing on this, and it wasn't public. Well, they did have a public hearing. But they had brought in some of their top scholars, history of science professors, uh, language arts, social, social, social sciences, mathematics, and so forth, history to debate myself, Dr. Beatrice Lumpkins, uh, Professor Emeritus of Math at Malcolm X, um, I think Dr. Ivan Van Sertima was there, and Dr. Hilliard was there, to, because they were convinced that there was no history of African people to mention other than our slave experience. And of course, they were proven wrong with the documentation that we brought to the table, and it was embarrassing. And so they convened the notion of having six baseline essays of African, African-American contributions to science and technology and medicine, which I wrote, um, history, which uh, Dr. John Henry Clark wrote, uh, music, mathematics, social, um, social science, um, language arts. And so those essays became a huge packet and I don't even think they're available now because the school district almost went bankrupt during the budget crisis for the state of Oregon in the 1990s. So, But anyway, that led to a national movement of 
black or African-American communities around the country clamoring for this cultural equity approach to education because that's what it was to include us in the curriculum all phases of it because we were left out and so people it was a, actually a disservice to the broader Euro-American community for them not to know the real history not to know the contributions um, of African people to this country in a whole range of fields but beyond that before we got here because the point was that African people had a history before coming to these shores before coming to Cartagena in Colombia South America before coming to Havana Cuba before coming to Jamaica we had a history as a people you know hundreds of different cultures and it was more than just song and dance because that's what it was being relegated to and of course um, many conservative people didn't like this idea because this was uprooting the standard educational practice that it was causing division it was saying that these people count. You know, these people, i.e. African people, actually have done something. And it was counter to their own education because they were taught those falsehoods. You know, there's a book, um, a number of books on, on history. Uh, I can't remember the, the titles now. Um, you know, what they didn't tell you in, in your history books um, and so forth. And so it was combating that. And people in other countries found out about this too. And so they began clamoring for inclusion, so to speak. You know, I mean, but even before that, you had the Negritude movement of Leopold Senghor, first president of Sing uh, Senegal, and Kwame Nkrumah and others. So this was a global phenomenon, and we participated in that. And unfortunately now, because of declining budgets, uh, media emphasis on shake that thing and smoke that blunk and give me that bling and so forth, uh, the whole cultural thrust has waned that young people aren't interested in it. They're, they are once they're exposed to it, mm. but given the media push for commercialization, uh, for materialism, that's, that's a big challenge in this country. But in other places, that's not the case. You know, as in Colombia and Brazil, there's a rediscovery of their Africanity now taking place, even thanks to um, the candidacy of Senator Obama now in France, African people, the Caribbean folks, and the continental Africans have come together. And they're saying, we got to start this negritude movement again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Even in Egypt, a friend just got back from Egypt. Egypt now, the government wants to be part of Africa and not the Middle East. Mm -hmm. That's profound. That's a profound shift. And so, but it's not happening here, you know, on the scale in other places. Sure, there's still people still pushing this, but the whole notion of inclusion of cultural equity, cultural equity, you know, it's not leaving out something, pushing other people to the side. No, it's, it's including everyone because we're in a diverse world. And I don't even like the word diverse because that speaks of division. When we talk about inclusion and equity, equity says there's been a wrong done. And so we have to restore a sense of balance. And so that educational movement, uh, African-centered or Afrocentric, um, was really important. And it still is. Just now with school budgets. Um, huh. <laughs> But when I think, when you talk about school budgets, I, I, I think that the budget is not the problem. 
because I think if we can... Well, it becomes an excuse. It becomes an excuse. I think that's what's happening, is that the budget has become an excuse. And when you talk about inclusion, inclusion is fine, but before you get involved with inclusion, you must have a program that supports an ethnic group. So if African-centered education supports the African contributions and influences of Africans, that can be that same framework can be used for an Asian-centered education mm -hmm. or can be used for a German-centered education. Mm -hmm. That framework has not been in place. So that's why when you talk about inclusion, you don't have a framework to include um, and a, 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 a segue to all ethnic groups, you know, so that they can understand and function within that, that, that framework that will allow them to accept the influences and the contributions of other people. Of other people. And that's something that Rooted Africans is doing. We're creating that framework saying that whatever region that you came from and the cultural nuances of that experience, we're not excluding that. But what we're extracting from it is the African-centered perspective that seems to be That's the a same as a common chord and, and, and extract those values, extract those um, experiences, extract that uh, um, lifestyle, you know, that everything is interrelated, nothing is separated. That's African, you know, and then someone said that's Asian. Well, we know the anthropologists have said that zero latitude, zero altitude was the beginning of um, humanity. That's Africa. So everyone has that DNA. Now the variations of that DNA has taken us to these different regions and so forth, and we have different expressions, but the core of it is African. So when you talk about that, when you talk about African-centered education, in the 80s, having the history brought to the table was key. To say, okay, you have to acknowledge this. We had an existence before the shores of North America. We had an existence before the shores of South America. We had an existence before the Caribbean, okay? But then, African-centered education is not just the history more than history. It's more than history. That is, is, is a, a strong chord in the tapestry of African-centered education. But it is not the only one. It is the lifestyle. It is the connection with life as it exists, life as it had exist, and life that we want it to exist. So it's, it's the past, present, and future all in one. And it's in your actions not just in what you are giving to the students academically, it's what you're giving to them in your presence, in your spirit, and in your understanding and your perspective, and giving them the global perspective of um, the experience of human life and the respect of it. And until we get that understood, then we are separating education from socialization. As Asa, was, oh, Asa said many times about the socialization right. of education, you know, education is the socialization of people. It is not separated. You can't academic, you, can't separate, you can't separate the two. You can academically give any child anything. But if you do not put it in the perspective of socializing them, making them activists, making them, and, and not making them, giving them an opportunity to become a, um, a lobbyist for human rights, giving them an opportunity to um, examine truth and to bring truth to power, giving them the opportunity so that they can feel comfortable about being a global citizen and understand that what they do somewhere else affects where they're at as well what they do here affects someone else. That there's, there's this is the socialization of human beings. And as and in rooted Africans, we take youth to Ghana. And it's a sojourn. It is not a, um, an opportunity for them to go on the shores and sit back and say, okay, this is a lovely place to come to. 
but it gives them a chance to examine who they are and give them a chance for their, their, their strengths to rise up. And, and they get a chance to actually examine it, you know, um, to the point that they make relationships. They, they create internet, well, not just internet relationships, they create a network of relationships with Africans all over the world and starting in Ghana, in the homeland, and creating and growing up with these networks of youth, their same age and seeing what they can do to enhance the quality of their own lives as well as theirs. African-centered education needs to be back on the table. Without, you know, with, without African-centered education, there is no education for youth of African descent. Because education, you know, the root word, educere, Educare means to bring, draw forth out of. If you are not bringing forth, as you say, give them the opportunity to become. Right. Because latent within themselves is already that African that Steve Cobb talks about when he chants, I want to free the African in me. There's an African in these uh, hyphenated uh, 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 names. You know, there's an African in the African American. Yes. You know, there's an African in the African Latina. Mm -hmm. There's an African in there who is imprisoned because that African is not given a a a a an, an outlet, a means of expression, and consequently, whatever it is you think you're doing, you are not educating if you are not including what is already right, there, right. what is already present within those that you, uh, you presume to, to teach. Right. So that, 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 that is something that we just need to understand. And when we ask the question, what is education for? We can no longer answer it, at least not in this part of the world, that it is go to school, get a good get an education yeah. so you can get a good job. We're looking at too much of, of the uh, contrary, evidence to the contrary, to believe that the purpose of education for African people in America should be merely to get a job. That is not to say that we don't need a, a means of making a living, which is different from getting a job according to Carter Woodson. Mm -hmm. But the point is that it not, the purpose of education should not be solely to obtain the the opportunity to work for others. You know, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was very good in reminding us what Marcus Garvey had said, the Honorable Marcus Garvey had said, and what Delaney had said, which was do for self. Mm -hmm. It was always understood that one should always learn to do for self and not be dependent upon others. So to go to school to get the kind of training that enables you only to be available to do for others and not to do for self is not a good purpose for education for Africans in America. So education has to have another dimension for us. It has to help us to grow, to become who we are and to know who that is. You said training when you were saying uh, to train us to, uh, for jobs and and that's what it was. Education in the past has been a, a tool to train youth, to either train them to become employees or to train them to uh, um, basically uh, conform to whatever menial job that to they would become. To train them to be employees and to be unemployed. Right. Not right, to right. train, no right. training to not work after you have gone, I, I know many, many people who have degrees and all, I myself have one mm -hmm. of those degrees that had no meaning before I even, before it was even put into my hands and that's a degree in educational administration. How many people can you train to run school systems, you see, who will actually have a school system to run when they have finished doing all of this work? 
toward learning how to run a school system. So you have to dis dif discover something else to do with your training because you find out that the job for which you are trained is either non-existent right. or obsolete, mm -hmm. but yet you know that you have to have revenue to live in a money economy. So you find another way to acquire revenue. Mm -hmm. But it is not because if you go to school and get this good education as a hospital administrator or as an MBA or whatever these degrees are that we are getting and going into great debt, mm -hmm. you know, student loans and all of that that follow people for years and years, right. for decades after they have gotten the good education, and then cannot find employment in the field for which they have been trained and then have to try to make what they have learned apply to something that is in no way related because education is, as you have already said, is disconnected. It, it, you know, you, you get a degree in, in political science and that's what you know. That's what you know how to do. If you can't be a political scientist, if you can't teach political science, if you can't get a job in government mm -hmm. using those kinds of skills, then you are just walking around here with a big head full of stuff that has no utility. So we need to ask, what is education for? And if education is for the purpose of knowing who you are and expressing that and arriving at the full potential of that being, if that isn't part of it, then whatever else you've got is valueless or of, of, of little value if not valueless. I won't go to the extreme of saying it has no utility but I will say that its utility is minimized because if you to gain the whole world and lose your own soul you know how many people have to have to tell us this right. is worthless. And I think what when you're saying um, that our children have these experiences and they're disconnected that disconnect comes from many layers. Mm -hmm. One, as a uh, former teacher in the classroom, is that you, as the teacher, have to make sure that they understand the connection. Mm -hmm. And then, as administrators, they have to make sure that their teaching staff understand that there's a connection. Mm -hmm. And as an administrator, they have to make sure that the district understand that there's a connection mm -hmm. and make sure that those connections are always functioning together. Mm -hmm. People are talking about jump starting a, uh, an economy. Well you jump start an economy that we're in right now by creating jobs. Mm -hmm. How do you create jobs? Well you give creative thinkers an opportunity to create jobs which create employment, which create cash flow, which creates a better economy. So and you start with first do no harm. Right. First do not squash and suppress the creative Creativity, thinkers right, mm -hmm. right. By, making them, by making them believe that their creativity can find no other outlet except what Hunter referred to in, in the uh, most obscene of hip hop music. Right. You know, this is where your creativity is rewarded. The more B's and H's you can identify among the females in your community, the more likely you are to come up, you know, into uh, some transient fame, you know, that'll give you your 15 minutes mm -hmm. before the viewing audience. So the, the creative is not even encouraged because haven't they taken art and music out of the curriculum? Art and music, music is still in, yeah. in fact, that was one of the first hits when Oregon, the state of Oregon was facing their budget crisis. Mm -hmm. They eliminated art and music. They eliminated the African centered curriculum. And, and by the way, its intent was, as Eris talked about, was to include other people. And other people, Asians, Pacific Islanders, European Americans, Latinos, each of them, and American Indians, each of them were going to create their curriculum mm -hmm. to work with the entire school system. Mm -hmm. But it collapsed and there was no other efforts made, at mm -hmm. least that I'm not aware of. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's culture is really key, is really key, but unfortunately many administrators don't get it. They're not feeling that yet and they're wondering why there's an explosion in teenage violence again. Is, is 
interesting. I was throwing away stuff and I came across a Chicago Defender from 1971. And the headline was, Gang Violence in Woodlawn Leaves X Number of Children Dead. That was 1971 and this is 2008. Mm -hmm. Nothing hasn't changed that much. Mm -hmm because the value in the culture hasn't changed, the value for life. The whole point of African-centered education was to, in, was to combat the valuelessness of life that so many of us and young people are exposed to via the media, via the music, music videos, you know, MySpace page, Facebook pages. You know, because people can express themselves, they're expressing themselves in the confines of the culture that they find themselves in. And we live in a very hyper media centered, commercial, materialistic, violent culture. And that has to be acknowledged. You know, 30,000 Americans are killed every year just with handguns alone. You know, and people get upset with 30 people are, are killed in Virginia Tech or Northern Illinois. It's terrible. But that said that there's some deep-seated issues here that the educational system has not socialized children to bring forth the best of their human potential. But we know the teacher training institutions, you've been a classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. Teacher training institutions train the teachers, impose or imbue them with the values that they bring to the classroom. Black children are not valued. Children of African descent are not valued in teacher training institutions. That's right. That's right. The, That's right. the teachers are trained to look for the middle class white child who has a command of standard English. That is the child of, who is the norm upon which the curriculum is based. These are the children who are on the films that are shown when they show the classroom, the would be classroom teachers what kinds American of experience, experiences <laughs> they can expect. Yes. That's right. So what I'm saying to you is that many times when new teachers come to the classroom, if it is culture shock for them, because mm -hmm. then they meet the children that they have never seen before unless they have relationships with children in their communities, which is not likely because the city is a place of anonymity where people can live next door to each other, That's even in the next apartment from each other, and not know each other at all. So they come into culture shock when they find that these are real children, and that not only do they have a vocabulary, which they have, have been told they won't have, but the vocabulary is extensive and it, is, it, is, it, it tends toward some very spicy language. So they have to get over a whole lot of things and they have to begin um, an adjustment which does not include their adjusting to the real world, but blaming the real world from being the real for being the real world. So then they say, okay, these children uh, come from broken homes. These children have parents who are drug addicted. These children have parents right. who are felons. These parents, these children don't have both parents. These children come from uneducated parents. These children. So they give themselves all the excuses for not trying to uplift the children and not trying to bring forth out of the children anything because they don't expect anything to be present. And so you have this vicious cycle where you cannot expect the administrators or the teachers to change the way they have been trained to earn their living because now they're in the game to earn a living. When you were saying that, the first thought that came to mind was the teacher certification program, mm -hmm. the ethnic teacher, ethno education or African centered education certification program. Okay. Because when you're talking about teacher training, mm -hmm. to have uh, the African perspective in, in, in their child, when a child is born, you name the child. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the name that you give that child is what the future you see 
within that child and mm -hmm. that future that that child has within that community. Mm -hmm. So you give life to the creativity that you expect from this child. And who does that? And where do they do that? Because you know we don't do that here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. So, come on. In Africa. Okay. All right. Okay. That's where the African-centered okay. values and the African-centered spirit, and even in, in, in Ghana, you mm -hmm. know, they, they, they acknowledge each other in the day that you were born, and then they give you a name for the spirit that you carry, mm -hmm. and the spirit that you will carry throughout the community. Mm -hmm. Now, here on the shores of North America, uh, there are educators that have in their minds that they're saying, okay, I want to change my future. Mm -hmm. How do I change my future? By the lives that I affect as a teacher. Mm -hmm. If I have a student that's 10 years, 10 year old, and 10 years they'll be 20. So in 10 years I want my future to look different. So I socialize them as well as I educate them academically to shift the paradigm as I see fit. That is the kind of power that educators have but don't know or and don't say, use and don't use you absolutely right a new teacher comes in um, when they have to do attendance uh, the lunch tickets they're dealing with the culture of the uh, school the culture of the administrators administration the culture of the children the community and then we have a lot of European um, teachers coming to the south side of Chicago or the west side of Chicago educating um, African children or um, northern African American children, wherever you want to identify us, but we're Africans um, first. And when they sign up for that, it's because they, you know, okay, I got a grant for two years to say that I'll, I'll get my education free for two years if I do two years in the inner city. Mm -hmm. So when they come, they're not equipped or prepared. And then when they get here, then there, uh, um, there's a sense of uh, dismay and um, a sense of, well, I can't do anything because of the violence in this community. I can't do anything because no par uh, parental uh, um, support, involvement. involvement. Yeah, support. Um, I can't do anything because, and not examining themselves, but if they went through an ethno or African-centered certification program, they would have to examine themselves. Why are you doing this? Why are you becoming an educator? I was told one time by a principal, and it really hurt my feelings. She told me, she says, oh, you know, you know the joke about educators. I said, no, I don't know the joke about educators. Well, when you can't do anything, become an educator. And this was a principal. Mm -hmm. Now, I valued being an educator. Mm -hmm. I value being an educator. Mm -hmm. And when you tell me that there's people in this industry or this, this, this profession or what I call this sacred calling that are just in here because they can't do anything else, then we have a responsibility as being called to the sacred task to call them out. And that's another challenge is that um, teachers refuse or they're not refused, they, they're apprehensive to communicate with another teacher. Hey, you know, this is a sacred calling. We're doing this together. Yes, you have total autonomy over your classroom. But as a unit, we are one in this, in this building because your student is going to come to me. If you teach in third grade and I'm teaching fourth, then your students are coming to me. I need to know about them. I need to know what areas that maybe you didn't challenge them in and what areas we need to work together so that we can make sure that they have that firm foundation from grade level to grade level to grade level. Now you know you just transition. For that or, you know you just you know you just you just touched the nerve here yeah. because you're saying <laughs> we need to work together. Where's the opportunity for teachers to work together? When you just got through mentioning mm -hmm. all of the clerical tasks mm -hmm. that I have to say this in defense of teachers because I was one for I over know. 40 years. Mm -hmm. The clerical tasks that teachers have to perform 
are overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Not only do you, you don't just have to keep attendance so that you can, the state can figure out how much money it has to give the, the public it's school system school. in right. the city. Right. You also have all of these other reports that come up from time to time. For example, at one point, there was some money that would be, would be made available to schools based upon the number of children who had parents who were either in the service or had served in the armed forces previously. And so every teacher had to, find, had to try to glean this information from every child by sending this, this, the packages home to parents and asking parents to fill out and return these questionnaires. Well, the first round didn't go so well because some of the questionnaires didn't come back and those that came back, many of them were incomplete. Right. So then the, they set the teachers to the task right. of, of completing these forms for right. every single child in the classroom. Right. So when teachers are overwhelmed with clerical work as they are, when they're overwhelmed, what they do is they write on the board the name of the, the uh, subject matter, social studies, chapter 12, read pages 1 to 30, answer the questions at the end, math, chapter 2, pages 1 through 4, do all the division problems, prove the, your answers. <laughs> Spelling, your work. Yeah. page 20, uh, uh, write, look up all the words in the dictionary <laughs> right. and write two <laughs> sentences for each word, mm -hmm. okay? So they, they put a menu on the chalkboard right. for the children to follow while they try to get this clerical work done. Mm -hmm. And the children, if they are good and, and, and quiet, they will go through one paper after another, and then they, they have either been instructed to bring it up and put it in the box on the desk, or the captain, the row captain will, you know the, you know the routine, will mm -hmm. pick up the papers and, and, uh, and turn them in. The teachers don't have, re have the opportunity to relate to each other. Right. They don't have the, op the opportunity to relate to the children. Now it's time to go to recess. Now it's time to go to lunch. Now it's time to dismiss. Now it's time to go home. I have to, had to, I've tried to stay in the building after the, the school is out because it's quiet and I can work there and I, at home there are distractions. I'm told I must leave the building. The custodian comes around and says, what are you doing here? You have to leave the building. We have to lock the building. So you get put out of the building, you can't come in the building until the custodians open the building, mm -hmm. and you can't stay there when they, after they lock it up. There is no interaction between the teachers except for the brief period that they have during the lunch hour when they sit in the lunchroom and they try to eat and have a social life for with each minutes. other. Right. Uh, so there's no cooperation. I don't think about you and what you're doing in your classroom unless your children are unruly or in some way I, I have some, some, some concern about what you're doing. Otherwise, we just know each other because we sit in the teacher's meeting and listen to the principal say mm -hmm. this and that. Mm -hmm. So there's no basis for a relationship among teachers for the unity for your that need That needs to be Absolutely. In place. And that's the whole thing about African-centered education. One of the things that rooted Africans that we have talked about is creating an environment in which those things can happen, mm -hmm. that they, everything is interrelated. Mm -hmm. you, the system that we have in place now needs to be wiped. We need to create a system that works for teachers, administrators, students, and parents. One model is to have for uh, one classroom three teachers. In the morning, you have one teacher come in teaching language arts, social studies, and she have a teacher assistant. She works from 9 o'clock to noon or 8 o'clock to noon. Then she goes to the office. They call it action re uh, research, mm -hmm. in which everything that she had taught during the class, she gets a chance to go over there to see how the children respond to it and what is the adjustment she needs to make. And her teaching styles reflective of their learning styles. And then she also have time to make calls to parents, do her paperwork, and so forth. 
The second teacher comes in in the afternoon and works from the afternoon until the end of the school day with the teacher assistant as well. So with those pieces in place, you have action research in which the teacher can examine the full potential of how the child is responding to the subject matter and the socialization of that subject matter. That then the second piece is that the teacher has a time to do their clerical work and that they're able to get their documents out. And at the third piece, that they're able to communicate with each other as well as communicate with the parents of what is going on in that classroom. Our children have been reduced to taking standardized tests and saying this is the measurements of their intelligence and in which that does not, uh, our children are not linear learners. They are non-linear learners. Who are the tests standardized on? Right. And then that, that's what I'm saying. Testing has to, we have to change that whole perspective. How are we measuring the intellect of our students, the creativity of our students? How are we instructing our students? How are we demanding clerical work from our teachers? We have to change the system. The system hasn't worked in that and has not worked for quite some time. But isn't that deliberate? It is deliberate. You're absolutely right. But I love There's the... There's no test for socialization skills. No. And the, uh, the obvious, uh, the obvious uh, 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 response to that is that we know that socialization is not being taught because we're always at war with somebody. Right. We can't, <laughs> Americans can't live in the world with other people. So we're not well so socialized as, as a, a people living in this part of the world. But when you talk about the teacher having time to do the clerical work and to do the action research, that's key, that very is. key, because that very is. often when you have all this clerical work to do in the classroom and you have children who are still churning out work, mm -hmm. now when you go home in the evening, you have a family, you right. may have meals That's to right. make and clothes yeah. and children to wash and iron them. and all of that. So you go home and you read some papers, but if you've got six or seven subjects going and you've got a, a classroom of 30 or more students or even 20 which mm -hmm. is never going to happen but 30 or more students you're not going to mathematically you are not going to grade all of those papers every day which means that you are not going to know what progress and where the glitches are you're not going to be able to see uh oh somebody mm -hmm. did not right. get reducing to the right. lowest common mm -hmm. denominator. That's correct. You're not going to get it. So you come, you've got your lesson plan already written for the whole week or the whole month, depending upon your administrator. So now you don't adjust your le lesson plan. You go in the next day, go to the next thing. You don't stop and do a review and, and bring that right. child up who, right. bring those children up who didn't get it that first time around. So you're absolutely right. If teachers don't demand to have some time set aside for them to do the clerical work that is necessary for them to, to, to monitor the progress of the students in their class, and they're flying blind. They don't, they don't right, have right, right. any right. air traffic com controls. <laughs> <laughs> they just out here flying right. through the air. On, on the point that I'm sure some of the viewers, uh, maybe not all of them, but there may be one or two viewers who say, wait a minute, you know, this cultural educational stuff, this ethno-education, uh, you know, we're all Americans, you know, we're all Colombians, you know, we're all Brazilians, you know, why do we have to have that? And I would ask them, there's a movement in the field of medicine, particularly in psychiatry, and also for doctors, that now doctors have to have some cultural, right. quote, diversity training that they have to be able to interact with their patients who may not be like them. They may not be Euro-American or white. They may not be Latino or Latina. They may be someone of another group. And so now you have a big movement of cultural psychiatry that if I'm going to be treating a patient, I need to know something about her or his background. I need to know, have some understanding of what they're bringing to the table and how their culture may be impacting their mental health 
or how their culture may setting them up for heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease. So the whole notion of cultural, ethnic centered education is very important. It has value and, and that can help those naysayers who have problems with, and there's a lot of them out here, to think through their argument, that they need to have a better argument as to why they think is problematic. It will do far more good than any ensuing or possible harm. For a person to know more and appreciate more about themselves as a particular ethnic group or cultural group will certainly impact their self-esteem and it'll impact those around them who are different from them because now they have another means to measure them, to relate to them, and that will enhance their relationship. We, we're, we're not just, you know, in this pot. You know, they always the talk about the melting pot. pot. You know, this is a salad bowl, and everything works together for the harmonious, in that case, consumption of the salad. But in this case, for the harmonious socialization of children. And that to be global citizens is very key now. You just can't be who you are. You have to be in tune with the whole world. You know, they just said that the last remaining part of the polar ice cap is going to be melted by this summer, by the time the summer is over. So it's important that people bring these kinds of issues to the forefront of education, that we have to socialize people now for a lot broader concerns. And uh, to learn more about, Eris will tell you more about her upcoming International Education Conference in Columbia. She better do it in 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds. Rooted Africans will be in Columbia August the 23rd through September the 1st. It's one voice, one vision, shared solutions. It is about um, the socialization of education through the African experience. So that is one thing that we're doing with uh, um, educators, ac um, activists, and um, concerned, conscious um, individuals that want to learn more about uh, ethno-education, African-centered education in the framework that we're working in. We're taking youth to Ghana so that they can have their own personal sojourn and um, have their ethno um, graph lessons of learning who they are. That's the third time. And this is uh, uh, a chance for them to experience uh, um, creating, socializing with other Africans in Africa as well as the African in themselves. I thank you. I thank you too, Hunter Havlin <laughs> Adams III and Iris White. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It was a pleasure. It was great. Well, not a good show. You just ran out of here.